A couple things here as, as usual as we get started. First, a couple housekeeping notes. If you could please uh, make sure you find that Q&A area inside of Zoom, because that's how we're gonna interact with you throughout the presentation. Uh, make sure that if you have any questions as we're going through, open up the Q&A, drop that question in, and drop it in really at any time. Uh, when we do, technically speaking, where we have uh, more than one host, I like to I like to see those questions as we're going so that if there's a question pertinent to what we're talking about, we can call that out. So find that Q&A area um, and make sure you drop those questions in there. So with that, let's go ahead and get right into it. Uh, my name is Brandon Burton, your uh, host today. I'm the Senior Principal of Industry Relations at CoreLogic, also the Chair of the ANSI IICRC Standards. Uh, but I've had an opportunity to introduce myself multiple times. I have not had the opportunity to introduce our co-host, Darren Foote. Darren is a, a wonderful and dear friend of mine uh, whom I've known in this industry for longer than I can even recall. Uh, Darren and I <laughs> crossed paths way back early in our, our days of being involved in the training side of the industry. In fact, that's what Darren does today. He's the president of LearnToRestore.com. He also assists in the industry standard of care environment, being the vice chair of the ANSI ICRC standard. So, Darren, thank you so much for being with us here today. And I'd love for you to, to share with folks uh, why training is, is just a critical topic for you. Brandon, I appreciate being here. I love your webinars and all that you offer to the industry. It's been, it's been wonderful for me to learn from you over the last year or so uh, on these webinars and, and way before that on many other topics. But um, I, I, obviously, we are the professionals. People don't call us because we have air movers and dehumidifiers and truck mounts. They call us because we know what to do with those things, the meters and everything else. So it's critical that we and our people know how to properly do the jobs for our clients. Absolutely, especially in an industry that can be so technical um, and so demanding on that technical end. I know there are lots of struggles that we have as an industry really maintaining that bar as it relates to ensuring we have the right skills and, and, and the right you new know, abilities in the field when, you know, it, it can be difficult just with turnover and staff and the challenges that restoration presents. You know, it's not a fun industry uh, when you sit back and really think about the fact that what you're dealing with is a whole lot of trauma and disaster and people's lives being turned upside down. And you, you really have to have a pride for what you do, which I, I think comes from that training and really understanding it, uh, which is a, a big part of what we're going to dive into. So, so thank you, Darren. Thank you for being with us here. Um, and if you could, I, I wouldn't mind if you could share with everybody just a little bit about uh, what you do and, and how training is a big part of, of kind of your day to day. If you don't mind sharing that with folks. I appreciate that. I, I've been in restoration for a little over, well, pushing 35 years now, I guess. And so uh, early on with my restoration company, I realized how critical training was. And as I was doing a lot of training for my clients and for my people, but sending them out to get training. And so I realized that training was something I wanted to become more involved with. And so I became an IICRC instructor many, many years ago, uh, started the school, became an instructor and have just seen that on both the technical aspect, on the formal training, as well as the informal training, it's like what I said a few moments ago, it's so critical that our people understand and that we understand what to properly do for our clients out there. And there's no way to get that to the end of the row except through proper training. Well, I'll, I'll throw in a, just a quick comment for those that are on with us. Um, I, I learned a long time ago from a gentleman that Darren and I both know, who unfortunately is no longer with us, but a gentleman named uh, Jim Myers, that uh, the best trainers that you could ever uh, partner with are those that are both humble and confident. I don't know if you remember that phrase from Jim, uh, Darren, he used to say it so many times. And uh, Darren, you're a great example of that. You know, a, a very, very humble approach, but very confident and competent in, in what, you, what you teach. So I'm excited to, to bring that perspective into this topic today as we go through internal training. So let me, let me kind of set the stage here a little bit. Uh, Darren and I are basically going to have a conversation about a number of different topics as it relates to internal training. Um, and we're going to give you a number of different thoughts on, on why it's important, what you should focus on, methodologies for how to do it. And, and this content, it, 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 it's really for everybody in your business. It's not just for that one person responsible for training in your organization, whomever that is, whatever their role is. Because training is really everybody's responsibility, and I'm going to really uh, stand on the soapbox quite a bit throughout the presentation today, but if you don't make training everybody's responsibility, then not everybody's going to own it, and that's ultimately where you've got to be, and we'll kind of, we'll kind of bring back that as a conclusion towards the end as well, but 
you've got to have buy-in. You've got to have ownership. And the only way to do that is to give everybody the, the opportunity to own what training is. So that kind of set as a stage, let's roll right into it and get into internal training. And the first place we want to start here is just a discussion about why internal training is important. Then we'll get into the what behind the internal training and the how to do it. But I think the, the importance is, is, is first and foremost, the first thing we've got to establish. So why is internal training important? And I'll, I'll kind of kick this first bullet off, you know, risk and, and liability mitigation in your business is paramount, right? For those of you that are a part of business management or business ownership, uh, this is the thing that kind of keeps us up at night is worrying about whether or not you know, today or tomorrow is going to bring, you know, that, that dreaded complaint that's going to turn into a conflict uh, for your business. And the number one way to avoid that, well, I'd, I'd say number one and number two, number one is probably customer satisfaction. We'll get into that in a second. But one of the number one ways to avoid that is just to ensure that the right tools, not just from a technological standpoint, but from a knowledge standpoint, are being deployed in the field. You know, and, and the example, and Darren and I were talking about this just the other day, but the example that from a technical side that always pops into mind for me is, if, just because I think like a water tech, if I don't find water in a structure because I don't understand properly how to assess water migration, and I leave undiscovered water inside of a property, then it doesn't matter how well I dry 95% of the building, Right. If 5% of it doesn't get dried and that 5% leads to additional damage and that leads to a complaint and that leads to a conflict, then I've failed the entire job, right? 95% is not a passing score when it comes to identifying water migration. And that's just an example of how training helps mitigate this risk and liability in the field. So I want to give you an opportunity, Darren, with each one of these as we roll through, did anything you want to share on risk and liability? I love that thought. And something else that I realized, I look at this slide, is we go out and we say we mitigate water damage. We keep it from getting worse. We stop it from turning into secondary damage. I love the fact that you put the term mitigation with risk and liability because we're trying to mitigate their risk in their home or their building. But if we don't have people that are properly trained, I do a lot of expert witness work and file review for clients who call and say, we've got someone claiming there's mold and it's our fault. What do we do? Well, <laughs> let's take a look at what you wrote down. And you know, if someone's going to use a hold harmless form, does that mean that they're taking part of the job out of the scope? Or are they saying, we'll do something wrong if you sign our form? And so it's so critical yep. that people understand what, when, how to, to mitigate their litigation. I love that phrase. Absolutely. Which, you know, it's a great segue into client satisfaction. I, a, a really, really good attorney in this space, a gentleman named Ed Cross, uh, was doing a training session that I attended. And he said, you know, and this all has always stuck with me. He said, you know, you don't get sued because you did a bad job. You get sued because you have an unhappy customer, right? And he said, you know, admit it or not admit it, at the end of the day, the most important thing is the satisfaction of a client, not necessarily the quality of the work. It's their perception of the quality of the work, um, which, you know, there, there's some interesting conversations you could have around that. But what it does do is it drives the importance of just how critical this is. And this is a big part of why training is so important. You know, I need to understand the challenges, the duress of that customer first and foremost, and then how my interaction with that project and how my interaction with the work being done directly impacts that. How to manage expectations, for example, or not set expectations that we can't achieve. Um, these all relate to having a proper understanding as, as a staff, whether it's the staff in the office or the staff that's in the field, for how we interact with a client in a way to, to really ensure client satisfaction is, is the end result. So uh, any thoughts there, Darren? I, I, again, on, I love that because yes, if someone's happy with you, then they're not going to come after you. They're going to work with you to resolve. And so when we talk about training and, and how, it, as you mentioned a moment ago, training is everyone's responsibility. If we have properly trained technicians, they can train the client in what to expect. And they should do that. This is an air mover. Its job is to dry a flat surface and bring the moisture into the air. This is a dehumidifier. Its job is to dry the air. This is an air filtration device. It's going to keep the dust down because we're doing some demo, but we're doing the best we can. You know, you don't tell somebody, you know, the, uh, the Jones's house down the street, you should have seen that. It was a train wreck. That's not what they want to hear. And so, yeah, the more, if we train our trainers to train the client into what to expect and expectations, then when there is a snag, we're working with them and not at odds with them. 
that's a that's a great way to phrase that. It's a wonderful way to phrase that. And if you'll notice, these all kind of cascade and kind of build upon one another. But a big part of, of client satisfaction is ensuring we have you know efficacy of the process, right? If our process fails for whatever reason, the more we have to excuse the reason for that failure, the more we're going to take you know, kind of a negative hit against that client satisfaction. Uh, so having the ability to not only manage the expectations, you know, understand when when we're making an educated guess in the field, educating the customer that that is what it transpiring, but at the same time, also ensuring that we have to make as few of those educated guesses as possible and, and have factual direction and, and a known outcome for the decisions that we're making is also very, very critical, which is difficult, right? In a, in a water mitigation environment, a fire restoration environment, a remediation environment, an odor abatement, whatever it is, you know, there's a lot of art that is behind that science. And the unfortunate part about the art is that art means that there's going to be some outcomes that unfortunately are not 100% predictable, right? And how do we manage those? How do we manage that conversation with the customer? How do we manage that in the field to ensure that we're managing expectations? All that kind of feeds up into that client satisfaction. So, and I would say with this section on that, Brandon, that it goes with the first two bullet points on efficacy, that things will be done consistently. So that for both liability management as well as client satisfaction, when they say, well, how come you're hammering something into my floor with the meter and the guy yesterday just set something on the floor? And so our <clears> processes <throat> are consistent, it, it helps us with the other two concerns as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. And then this, this kind of rolls up into the larger picture, which is, you know, your project cycle efficiency. I, I think one of the things that, that really defines the success of a restoration company is managing the, the kind of the costs and expense of doing business in this type of an industry to the point where, uh, you know, the, the amount of time that we're waiting to collect on accounts receivable, um, that we're dealing with these kinds of problems and challenges, which can delay payment, will we mitigate that as much as possible? Because there's a tremendous cost to project cycles being extended. And the more we can manage the notification of loss of the receipt of payment, the more we can manage that timeline and reduce that timeline, the more we remove a lot of those hidden costs of doing business in this space. I've seen a lot of restoration companies that that's the primary reason why they're suffering or potentially even failing is just of how, how extended this project cycle becomes because they're not managing that properly, which again rolls all the way back into uh, these three first points that we've made about internal training. So uh, would you agree with that, Darren, that that's project cycle efficiency? You've got more direct experience in the business ownership and the business management side than I do, uh, but would you agree with that? That's always been kind of my belief. It's critical. It's critical, especially the way we build some of our jobs out. And so, yes. And, and again, along with that and the other bullet points is realizing that the frontline people on the ground are making all the decisions oftentimes. What's the category? Should I tear out the tile? What are the meter readings that are going to actually determine the stability and viability yep. of our companies? So. Yeah. And then last but not least, the other reason that I felt in, in the top five reasons why internal training is so important uh, is employee retention. So we've got another slide that's going to break this down further. So let me jump forward on that um, and kind of break this down into a couple of conversations. Uh, but one of the reasons for me, at least, and this is part of the reason why I've always been so passionate about training in, in my career in the industry, is that I have to have context, right? I think many people are wired this way. I have to have context for what I'm doing. If I don't understand what I'm doing or, or how something works behind what I'm doing, the, the larger role or, or place that it serves in the grand scheme of things, how it impacts the business. If I don't understand these things, it's really difficult for me to see my role as having a purpose. And if I don't see my role as having a purpose, you know, it, it really draws the wind out of my sails, right? And all of a sudden, I'm, I'm just an employee doing A, B, C, D, because that's what's on a list. And that's the, the last place you want especially quality employees to be. Um, and I know, Darren, you've got some passion around this particular topic. So feel free to share anywhere you'd like on, on employee Again, retention. Thank you. For that. I, I, one thing I mention often in my classes is you're here spending your time and money to be in this class, or you're here because someone who has confidence in you is spending their time and money to have you in this class. And that's why I was so passionate about training in my own company is because when I've had people in my classes, we're talking about meters. And they say, I've never, they just handed you one and said, go write down on the sheet of paper what the number is. And now I understand how to use it. This is great. And so, like you said, it provides them a purpose. It gives them confidence among their peers. It gives them confidence with the clients to know what to do and how to properly ask questions. So it just gives them a real feeling of value when they've got the right information. 
Absolutely. And then that, and like I said, just with the previous slide, it kind of rolls into the next point. But what that does also for those employees, it really highlights their opportunity for growth, right? They see an opportunity to become more knowledgeable, uh, to become uh, you know, more skilled in that trade and grow in their responsibility for the project types that they can serve, the depth at which they can manage into those projects. Um, because training really not only gives you the opportunity uh, for the employee to see that, but it also gives the employer the opportunity to see the potential in those employees at the same time, especially with the methods of training that we're going to talk about in a little bit, which I think will really, really help your business understand kind of that human resource and just how valuable that can be to your business. And we'll get to that. Um, but it highlights that growth opportunity uh, for the employees in your organization. Absolutely. So, where do we focus? So that's kind of where I want to go next. So where do we focus on training in an organization? We can, we can talk about two buckets here. We're going to talk first about what I want to call the technical bucket uh, for areas in your organization, if especially mitigation is a key part of what you do, uh, and then the non-technical, some of the areas outside of the technical. And it's really important to focus on both buckets. Um, I'm going to start from my personal bias, and then, um, and then Darren, if you would just kind of alternate these. Um, but Monitoring methodology has always been one of the, the biggest paramounts for me. Um, for anybody who's ever been through like an ASD training with me or something like that, uh, I spend a lot of time focusing on this little flow chart here that you see on the right hand side. The four no's of drying is one of the ways I've heard this described, but if I don't understand how to properly measure what's happening in a particular a water mitigation project, understand the scope of what I'm dealing with, understand the impact uh, I'm having on that affected area, and ultimately the rate of progress I'm making towards that end goal. Everything else is just a means, right? It's just a matter of a means of getting me to those points. What I have to do is be able to validate that. And the reason for that is because nothing is absolute in water mitigation, right? Just because two air movers and a DHU worked on a 100 square foot bathroom last time doesn't mean two air movers and a DHU is going to work the next time, right? There's just too many variables uh, that are at play that we cannot properly assess. So monitoring becomes uber, uber critical to me. And it's also one of the main points of failure in most mitigation businesses because of a lack of consistency. You know, and, and Darren, you touched on this earlier. You know, I need to understand the meter, the setting, the scale, the location. All of these things have to be done consistently. And I've, you know, in some of our previous, technically speaking, I've spent a lot of time on that soapbox, so I won't go too much deeper here today. But this is a core area your business should really focus on, is what meter do we use with which particular installation? How do we use it? Um, and how do we document that information, which kind of puts me up to the segue to bullet number two, Darren, if you want to take this one on documentation and how we focus on documentation and training. Absolutely. I am going to make two quick comments. One is, if you have not seen all the series last year that Brandon did, go to the website and watch it. There's such valuable information there. And just to clarify, Thank when you, Brandon Jeff. talks about the four no's of drying, that's not no, don't do this. It's things you need to know about drying. So if you haven't heard that before. Uh, I, I can't say enough about documentation. You will live and die by documentation. You will make money or go out of business by a documentation or lack thereof. And so every little thing that happens needs to be documented. What, you know, not just applied antimicrobial, but what brand, what dilution ratio, where on the, on the floor and two feet up the wall, what was it? What meter did you use? What brand, what model? Was it, was it invasive or non-invasive? Uh, you know, if, if, you are, if you're determining category, don't just say category two say it was a dishwasher overflow that happened yesterday, therefore it's a category two. Give somebody who's reading your report one or two sentences on your, on your thought process. Uh, one thing I would say is when it comes to documentation as far as class of loss, air movers and things like that, remember the second grade and show your work. Do the math and put it in your documentation. But this is, this is real, like I said, I've seen, I've seen litigation literally go away overnight because a contractor had great documentation. Yep, absolutely. And I've seen wonderful, wonderful restoration projects that end up becoming a nightmare because the documentation wasn't there. Amen. Um, I, I, an example that always has stood out to me, uh, and as you were talking, it made me think of this, Darren, uh, that has always stood out to me from, and this will date me, but it was a project back in the, in the early 1990s. Uh, where a contractor had you know, successfully dried a structure and, and arguably based on all the documentation, uh, you know, did, a, did a good job. They just made one mistake in the documentation. They didn't understand the terminology properly. And they had stated that they had dried a section of drywall to 10% moisture content. 
um, and a, a consultant hired by the you know the opposing side that represented the property owner um, used that 10% moisture content as evidence for the fact that they left the building wet enough to support mold. Um, and use that in turn as a way to point to the contractor as being a fault for a bunch of mold that was discovered underneath the kitchen sink. Um, and the reason they were able to do that and create such a such an absolute nightmare for the contractor is that 10% moisture content in drywall is plenty wet enough to support mold. In fact, it'd probably be oozing off of the wall <laughs> in a liquid state if you had a true 10% moisture content. The mistake the contractor made is that they used the term percentage moisture content and stood by that term. They defended that term until they finally realized that, oh, wait, that's not how we record moisture in building materials. We use a relative scale, and 10 is what it would have been if it were the species of wood that meter were calibrated for, but it wasn't, so it ain't. Um, so <laughs> uh, it's, it's interesting that even in documentation, kind of getting into just the next bullet here, understanding how these things actually work in this industry is really important. Understanding the way the meters operate, their limitations, understanding you know, what makes an air mover effective in, in drying, what makes a dehumidifier effective in drying, uh, what makes the chemistry effective in fire restoration, what makes odor counteractants effective, and therefore when are they useful and when are they not. Um, these mechanics are critical because we're, we're making really critical decisions based on this, we're communicating based on this, we're documenting based on this. And uh, you know, Stephen Covey put it really well with the phrase that you've got to sharpen the saw, right? A little out of context for Stephen Covey, but I think it's an important statement. You know, the reason why internal training is so important is because you have to, you have to continue uh, to focus on training in order to keep and maintain that level of training, because it'll never be perfect, right? It'll never be perfect. Um, so, yeah, and thank you for that observation, Darren. I've, I was forgetting to advance my slide. Uh, so I'll <laughs> advance the slide there, thank you. I, I, uh, I so, maybe it's just me, you know, but I thought I'd check, so. <laughs> so that leads us off into a, a, pa a topic that I know is passion for both you and I, Darren, and that is standards. I'll, I'll give you kind of first cut here on the standards piece. I appreciate that. I'm gonna jump back just for a moment, if I might, to documentation. Absolutely. There's one thing that's just so critical to me when if you know people over the years have come to us and said what do you do for a living and you try to explain restoration and we say well here you know what do you do we extract water we block furniture we put in equipment to dry it out what's your product and you could say a dry building you know or, or whatever but i've always said my product is documentation and a big part of that is not yeah. just risk management or getting paid those are certainly critical but a big part to me is that we reestablish the value of the property so when someone goes to sell their home and has to disclose i had water damage that's a problem and somebody doesn't want to buy their home, they say, but here's the proper documentation. And now I've retained the value in my home because this was done, done right, and documented correctly. And to me, that's a very important part of why we document jobs. Absolutely. And on standards, uh, yeah, couldn't, uh, couldn't agree more. That is a passion. Brent and I served together uh, over the, on the standards. And it's a great thing to do. Know your standards. Understand your standards. If you're going to train internally, someone has to be trained externally. Someone has to know what they are. The words that I cringe at all the time when I hear them or see them on Facebook is the S500 says, or according to the S500, and the words that come after them, like that is not in the S500. And if it is, it's completely <laughs> out of context. And yeah. you'll either do the work incorrectly or you'll say it incorrectly, or you'll have a client or adjuster hold you to a standard that doesn't exist. Well, the S, you know, one of the examples I use at, often in training is, I'll bring up a picture of a crane fly. I grew up being told that was a skeeter eater. I always thought that don't kill those, eat mosquitoes. They don't. I didn't know that till last year when I finally looked it up. But everybody in class is like, it's a mosquito hawk, it's a skeeter eater, it's, you know, and they're not. And so when people say the S500 says, well, go, good, go look it up, find out for yourself and see it in context. And so if you're carpet cleaning, get an S100. If you're cleaning upholstery, if you get an S300. If you're doing water damage, you know, S500, mold 520, get the appropriate standard for the services you're offering and make sure that you know it. And I'm going to use the phrase again and get that information down to the end of the row. And it also, you know, standards provide you a great uh, source book for a lot of your internal training too. Um, you know, you can just, you can just pick five paragraphs out of a particular standard uh, for the group uh, that is working on something and then uh, and just say, hey, here's the five pages that we're all going to read, and we're going to come back and have a discussion around at this next meeting that we're going to have or the technical training we're going to have. And it's, so it's a great source book uh, for, for really calling where you're going to focus your internal training. And again, we'll talk about some of that. 
Uh, but I'll use that as a segue to jump into terminology. Um, terminology is another point to me is kind of a picking point, just like uh, moisture content as a, as a topic that I shared with you just a moment ago. And that's just one example of many that we could use where words really are important. Uh, and the specific words that we use to describe things are also very, very important. Um, and I would spend a lot of time here with your technical teams, your technical group, uh, anybody who has to read or prepare documentation uh, or talk about or discuss that documentation in some way, um, that there are particular terms that you really need to pay special attention to. And the best place to find those terms is under the definition sections of the relevant standard. Um, whether whether you're talking about water or you're talking about remediation, whatever it is, uh, those definition sections in the front of the book, not the ones in the back, those are the glossary, a lot of great terminology back there, but if you want to filter it down to the ones that are probably the most critical to understand, it's the definitions that are in the front of the book, which is a shorter list. Uh, and really focus on those terms and making sure that those are universally understood amongst those that need to understand them, right? Those, again, that are going to interpret the, the report information, prepare the report information, or follow that report information. Those terms need to be well understood. I would never want on a piece of official documentation that's going to be used to defend my business and my organization terminology that's being misapplied or misused, especially the ones that come in the front of those books. So terminology is important. All right, it is absolutely important. Uh, as I flip over to the next slide, Darren, do you want to talk at all about terminology? Uh, you've nailed it. That's exactly right. Knowing how to say it, what to say, and then using the right terms is so important. Perfect. Let me not forget to flip slides this time. <laughs> all right, <laughs> let's move over to the, the non-technical side. So we talked a lot about all the technical pieces that are important to focus on. There are also a lot of non-technical pieces to focus on. Uh, and we've tried to kind of zero these down into what we feel are the most important. Uh, arguably, there could probably be some more items on this list. But let's start with client empathy, right? Um, client empathy is, is an interesting topic. It's not client sympathy. Um, it's client empathy. I, I think it's important when you're you're dealing with a disaster in a property, whatever that type of, of disaster is, it's really important as a, as a technician or, or as a staff member that's on the phone with a client, it's important to understand the position that that individual is in. Uh, so a little bit of awareness training with your staff to be empathetic to that situation and that circumstance and knowing that this is probably one of the three or four most traumatic events in most cases, in many cases, uh, that this individual has probably experienced in their entire life, uh, right? You've got obviously a couple that are probably more traumatic, but you go down about three or four places on the list and a significant loss in personal property is going to be in that top five. Um, you got to kind of empathize with the fact that this, especially in a, in a home where there's been a fire or a significant water damage, you know, this is the place they live and breathe and, and raise their children. They store all of the worldly belongings that have any significant importance to them. And this is where they shelter from, you know, all of the, the, the traumas that occur in everyday life outside the home, right? They shelter from that. But that's just been invaded, right? And that foundation of, of trust they have with protection in that home is, has now been has taken a huge hit. And just think about the impact that that has on the individual and come about the conversations, the interactions with empathy for that position. That's always been a big one for me. Um, and Darren, feel free to share anything with empathy I, and, and take us into, into stakeholders. Uh, th this is make or break on successful project right here yep. because realize that it's, you know, first of all, maybe their home is damaged. And so they're financially concerned about the biggest investment they've ever made. All the things you talked about, about the personal aspect of it. They're now worried about coming up with an insurance deductible and missing work and the financial impact this is going to have. Are my insurance rates going to go up from this? You know, what's it going to cost overall? And all the, you know, do I have to move out somewhere? There's so much going on. And so that's what I was kind of mentioning before was they don't care about how bad another job was. They don't want to hear about all the other jobs you've done that day. I, I always try to help my team understand when we show up at a job site, they should feel like the whole reason we went into business 20 years ago was in case your washing machine host fell last night. This is it. This is our whole purpose in life. And, and kind of walk them through the process. I'm sorry you're going through this. And here's what to expect. Here's what's going to happen. Here's, yeah. here's the next five-day plan. And, and, and make them a partner in the process so they understand it. Uh, just a quick example that hit my mind while you were talking, Darren. Um, first of all, I love the phrase that you just shared. Like the whole reason you went into business was to take care of that problem for them. I, I love that phrase. Uh, but it reminded me of, uh, of a water damage I was on a long, long time ago. Uh, one of the very first times I'd had an opportunity to restore a hardwood floor. Uh, and I was super excited, right? I, I, I had lots of ideas on how I was going to approach this hardwood floor. 
And unfortunately, that excitement showed through to the property owner. Um, and I'm sitting here with my hammer probe getting ready to put some holes out in the middle of this hardwood floor. And I'm super excited. And you can tell I'm excited. And this, I lost all faith and credibility with that property owner in an instant. And that taught me really, really quickly uh, just how important client empathy is. I can laugh about it now, but that was a very uncomfortable uh, monitoring visit, I'll, I'll say to the least. Um, you know, Brent, important I, life lesson. That reminds me as well. I had a uh, great client, two o'clock in the morning. My guy, it, it, we've been working like weeks, some freezes, lots going on. And one of my folks, great guy, but he was just, he had it. And he went up to the truck and was kind of banging stuff around and letting some steam off. Didn't know the client had followed them out there to ask him a question. It was just, and so I had a rule. I said, you can complain about a job all you want. You have to be in the truck two miles from the job site, windows up. And then I don't care what you say about it. But the entire time you're on the job site, have that demeanor. So, Absolutely. Um, and then I'm, I'm going to give you the bullet on industry stakeholders here, Darren, if you want to kick this one off. I think it is just so important to realize that oftentimes we say, look, my client is the business owner, the homeowner, the property owner. That's who I'm working for. That's who I'm contracted with. That's who I expect to collect my money from. That's who's, you know, I've got this fiduciary responsibility for. But there are other people involved. If it wasn't for insurance companies, and you know, I, I get all the you know stories that go on. There's there's bad contractors, there's bad insurance adjusters. It goes both ways. But if there wasn't insurance companies, nobody would be paying us five thousand dollars to dry out their living room. You know, I mean, there there, there is a relationship there. And so mm -hmm. I think I always took a project on and said, if I were this house, what should be done to me? How do yeah. I make the client understand why I did it? Why? How do I make the third party or the insurance company or the property management team or the real estate agent or the insurance agent who sent me out. How do I help them understand that sending me out was the very best decision they could have made? And, and yep. I would try and this might be a silly thing, but you know, we'd go market to insurance agents and say, this is who we are and what we do and say all the same stuff everybody else does about being available 24 hours a day. And, and, uh, but the time I'd go see him was when I was leaving a job site and my knees were soaking wet and I had drywall ground into my pants and I looked like heck. I'd go to their office and say, Mrs. Jones is doing okay. This is what's going on and she's going to be all right. She's worried about this. Could you reach out to her and let them know? I want to train my agents that we are actually doing what needs to be done in yep. the field. Absolutely. And, I, and I've heard this phrase this way a lot, but that the reason I, I threw this graphic on the slide is, is for it, the exact uh, uh, thing that you said just a moment ago, that there are a number of stakeholders. And I think what a lot of us overlook is that the project is the paramount of those stakeholders, right? And really think about what serves the project best, because that's the common interest that all three of these groups of stakeholders have, whether you're the property owner, you're a third party like an insurer or a TPA or whoever else it is, or you're the service provider, right? All three of you in, in these buckets have a common shared interest in what is best for the project. You may also have other interests, right? But those interests are the ones that that tend to take a project in the wrong direction. It, it's, the, it's the project's interests that matter most. That's what centers the documentation. That's what centers the justification for the work being done, et cetera, et cetera. So it's really important to understand that the project is key in, in that circle of stakeholder interest. Um, and then we get into the project cycle. This is another area where I think training is also important, is helping uh, helping those in your organization understand that the job isn't isn't the beginning and it's not the end. The job is kind of the middle, right? There's a lot that happens before the job occurs and the overall project cycle. There's There are things that occur after the, the project occurs and, and things that are occurring before and after that project all impact the success of that business, right? How well, how well we receive the information, when we receive the information, how we receive the information, the clarity of that information, the mobilization, all of that on the front side. And then on the back side, how well we're documented, how well we're justified, uh, how well the estimate reflects what has been justified in the documentation in the file, and then ultimately when you know, we can close that file because we've received payment in full. You know, that the front end and the back end, those two bookends, if you will, are really, really critical, I think, for everybody in your business to understand because they all touch it in one way or another, right? Um, and they're all impacted by what happens in those other phases in one way or another. So it's, it's important for that full project cycle to be something that we all have visibility and clarity into, at least at a high level, so we understand what the full life cycle looks like. So any thoughts there, Darren? Yeah, Brandon, one thing that I re strongly recommend is have, have your people train your people. And what I mean by that is in different aspects of your organization, have your salespeople train the office staff, 
and the technicians what they're what they're talking about. What promises are they making to your clients? Yep. Have the technicians talk to the office staff and the salespeople and say, this is what's actually happening on the ground and why we can or can't do those things. Have the office staff train everybody else and say, this is the process of the paperwork and this is why we need it. So if everybody has an idea of what the other team members are doing, you've got a better flow in the project cycle because you're, you're making and keeping promises. You're not over-promising, but you can over-deliver. Absolutely, which, uh, which is a great segue for where we're going to go next. What makes training successful? Um, and and kind of give this an overall title. It's got to be your organization's personality. It's like you were touching on, Darren. Uh, training, is, it's got to be a way of life in the organization, not just you know, something that happens every once in a while. Now, training, training isn't that, that one class you go to. Training is a, a way of thinking. It's a mode of thinking in your, in, in your organization. And it really needs to reflect who you are as an organization and its personality. Uh, and to kind of articulate that, let's kind of run through each one of these. And Darren, why don't you go ahead and take the first one and then I'll jump in on number two. So one of the things I think from start to top is, <laughs> this is probably a bad example. My wife and I, have, a, have an eight-month-old eight uh, Bernese Mountain Dog puppy. And we're in the middle of his teenage years right now, and we're getting really frustrated. And so we're doing a lot of online stuff. We're doing training classes, taking some training. Because with the dog, we just lost our 13-year-old Golden. He was the best dog. He was just so well-behaved. And so right now at this stage, we either train him, take the time and energy and effort to train him, which is a total pain and frustrating, or we know that for the next many years, every time the doorbell rings, he'll be jumping up on people. And so if it's part of your psyche to say, how do we help people understand what's expected of them? They're, he will be so much happier when he knows and understands the rules because we're all going to enjoy life better. And so, it, you know, starting to talk is that attitude of it's not just say this is what to do, but the other thing we talked about, we're getting into the why, the what, here's all the important reasons of why we value enough to train you and, and that we've been trained that we're going to keep that cycle going. Absolutely. And then once that cycle is going and running, you know, we need to make sure that we have, you know, the the metrics or the methods to validate that it's that it's sustained, right? That it's ongoing. You know, is it really happening means that your business needs to make it apparent to everybody in the organization that it's that it's important by measuring it, right? Um, I, I would encourage that in some way, shape, or fashion, you know, the amount of training that is occurring, the, the schedule for that training, the ownership of that training, the fact that it's everybody's responsibility and that it matters is very, very visible to the organization. Uh, and that really shows, you know, coming from the top all the way through the organization that it's, that it's a critical. It is a part of that personality. It needs to be something that you see and that you feel uh, as you're interacting with your organization as an employee. Uh, and I would highly encourage that it's even something that's visible to those that aren't necessarily employees. You know, it needs to be something in the way that you market and brand uh, and a commitment to the fact uh, that, that training is a huge part of what you do. Uh, and again, we can expand on that a bit, but it's really happening means the numbers have got to be visible. You know, the metrics, that, that means the organization cares. Brandon, just a quick, I'm going to jump back for a second and then come back and start at the top. The other thought on starting at the top is that the people at the top, the leadership need to do what they're training others to do. Because if you say it has to be documented and not on a phone call, then you don't do it. Then you've just completely lost the credibility on that. And they go, okay, I guess it's not important. And that goes down to, is it really happening as well? I've heard people in the field where someone says, you know, the brand new technician says, okay, they told us we have to fill out this form. How do we do it? And the senior technician says, I've been here for three years. I've never done one of those and they've never asked me about it. Okay, then yeah. <laughs> the training obviously did no good. So it's gotta be happening, you know, and there's gotta be a way. And, and, and another thing, we'll, I may be getting ahead of this a little bit, but when someone really excels, when they turn in a phenomenal bit of documentation, whatever, it's a great thing to say, hey, I love that. Would you take a few minutes in our next meeting and explain to you, you know, how you did that and let them shine for what they did and pass it along? Absolutely. And then focus on the why, not the what, right? Um, I mean, the what is important, uh, but without the why, and uh, the what doesn't matter as much. Um, you know, you can't just say, this is exactly what I need you to do. Uh, you need to ensure that a part of that training is understanding the reason why that what is so important. And again, I'll use a technical example. Uh, if, I, if I am just administering in, in a process that we use this meter in this way on this material, and I don't explain the reason why that's so important, it's really difficult to get everybody to buy in. And we're not going to be successful in truly implementing that process. But if everybody understands that consistency is critical to monitoring, and that if I change the meter, the location, the scale, any of that, 
then I can't compare two days where the numbers, we're not going to know if we're making progress, we're going to make the wrong decision, and we're going to end up not getting paid for some of the work we do or causing damage. If all that's understood, and we understand the why behind that what, now it's, it's easier to get that commitment and that buy-in because everybody understands the reason that process is critical. Uh, and I just give you the one example from a technical perspective, um, but having said that, the why is important behind any what that we're putting into a process for training. The, the why is so empowering. You know, just a, maybe a bad example, but you tell a little kid to wash their hands before dinner and they do it because they were told to. You explain to them about germs and then they want to wash their hands before dinner. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm going to take a, a quick moment here is because we're getting close to the last few slides here. Uh, just as a reminder that if you have any questions you'd like to put before Darren or myself that have anything to do with the world of mitigation and <laughs> restoration, uh, even if it's outside of the world of training, we'll do our best to tackle it. Uh, so don't hesitate to start dropping those questions in the Q&A because we're going to be getting on top of those here pretty quickly. Um, as we do that, though, let's transition into uh, kind of the, the how. Uh, behind the training and how we get the training accomplished. And I think the first step in how you do it is creating ownership. In my mind, the and in, in, in my, my experience and expertise, the best way to create buy-in and, and energy and success behind training is to make everybody a trainer. Right? I don't care, I don't care who you are in, in my technical team, you're going to contribute to the training. Right, you're going to be a part of that training. You're going to have something that you're going to train everybody else on, that you're going to research, that you're going to find the answers to, and that you're going to then deliver to everybody else and that team in the organization, whether it's a small team or a larger team, you know, depending on the individual and the role. But everybody's going to participate. And there's no better way to really create investment and buy-in into what you're administering for training, then making everyone responsible and everyone also therefore an owner in that process. Uh, and to me that, even though there's a lot of anxiety with a lot of folks that are in our organizations about serving a role like this, there, there are ways that you can mitigate how it's done or manage how it's done to, to really uh, reduce that, that, uh, that sense of, of anxiety for being, you know, participating in training. But it's important. It's critical that we push everybody in the organization to participate at some level and in some way. And if you have somebody that's they're just absolute dead set against standing in front of even two or three people and explaining a process, uh, then at least have them be a part of assembling the, the information that somebody is delivering and have them have a sense of ownership in what is being administered. So everybody has to be a trainer in order for the personality to truly resonate through your organization that training is important. So um, everybody's a trainer. That's what that means to me, Darren. Uh, anything you want to share there? I, yeah, I love that. And, and again, I kind of mentioned this before, but I've been on job sites where you hear people say, I've never done it. Nobody cares. I've also been on job sites where around the corner, you hear someone say, no, let me show you how to do this. This is how we do it. And this is why. And that's yeah. gold. That's just pure gold. And so I love it when I can say, hey, you know, Joe, Mary, Sue, whoever, you know, at our next meeting, will you take 10 minutes and show us how to take a meter reading? And then we're going to have a, a discussion to make sure we're all on board. And the people who absolutely can't do it, they're usually willing to do a one-on-one. -on -one. Hey, we've got this new person. Would you show them how to use the meter? So they can train in a very small, because then it's not training, then it's sharing, then it's helping, then it's assisting and bringing someone up. And so there's always ways that they can do that. Uh, but those that shine, make them train and, and help everybody understand that our job is to make sure that the next person understands. And that, like I said, that's, that's training coworkers, it's training our, our clients, everybody, and what we're doing, why we're doing it. Absolutely. And then you know, there's different uh, kind of mechanical ways that you can put training in your business. I'm going to talk to one example that I have here on the slide. Um, and then Darren, uh, I, I think as you and I were talking earlier, you also have some, some examples that you want to share. But just, just this one example I want to give is that one of the methods of training in your organization should be this fast and frequent method where, where at least once a week for, a, for about 15 minute maximum time period, uh, you, know, you have a technical presentation that's being given during that Monday meeting where you have your technical staff together, where you dedicate just a little bit of time out of that, that production meeting or whatever else it is. And everybody knows ahead of time that, hey, it, it's gonna be, it's gonna be you know, Josh's turn next uh, he's going to go next week, and Josh is going to talk about X topic. And Josh knows a week ahead of time, this is what I've got. I've got to do my research. I've got to pull my information together. Maybe you want to run them, have them run it by the project manager before they deliver it or whatever else, uh, or the, or the uh, division manager. 
But just a quick weekly hit, and it doesn't even have to be 15 minutes, it could be 10 minutes, long enough that you can deliver a particular point against a process or a technical topic, uh, but short enough that it, it doesn't uh, become a cumbersome process that ends up falling to the wayside because it's taking away from other things you've got to accomplish in those meetings. But at least weekly, and if it does nothing else, it's going to communicate that this is going to be an ongoing, continuous focus for the organization, that everybody is going to participate in the process, and that at some point, uh, everybody's going to end up having to play that role of delivery, uh, or at least preparation for that delivery, as we, di we discussed earlier. And that's one way you can implement just a short, quick hit. Um, and there's a side note to that. If you ever want some support in developing one of these, you know, kind of 10-minute segments you're going to do in your organization, don't hesitate to reach out to me and say, hey, Brandon, help me with a 10-minute presentation. I'll help you put one together. That's how important it is to me. So, uh, so don't hesitate to reach out for that. But that's one way that you can administer that. It's these quick, short hits, but spread the love and make sure that it's being delivered by different roles and, and individuals in your organization. So that's one, one method, Darren. I know that you, you and I talked about some of the longer Longer yeah, so I, I would say that what Brandon just said is 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 invaluable. It's so important to do this to, to develop a training you know, uh, ownership and, and a culture. That's what I was looking for. And yeah. if you have if you get together for ten or fifteen minutes, that's a huddle. If you get together for longer than that, that's a meeting. So this is supplemental. Yes, once a month, <laughs> once every three weeks, six weeks, you're going to have training and say we're coming together for forty five minutes, an hour and a half, and we're going to learn extensively about this topic, whatever it is. But these that just it just it gives an on, an ongoing constant training is important to our organization and you get in you get out and move on so no it's a, it's a, an amazing thing huge results and i realize i forgot to advance my slide again <laughs> <laughs> so with that i, I see uh, by the way thank you josh for getting our first question into the q a we're going to tackle that here in just a second but let me go through just a, a couple of housekeeping outros real quick first First and foremost, I want to thank you, Darren, for joining me on Technically Speaking um, and, and helping me address a topic that's so near, near and dear to my heart uh, with training. Uh, this is a very large topic. We can spend a lot of time talking about how to do this. Uh, so I want to first just extend that invitation again. If this is something you're struggling with in your organization, then reach out. Okay, reach out. My email address will be on the next slide uh, and a, or a couple slides ahead here. Uh, feel free to reach out, and I would love to support you in that. You could also find Darren at LearnToRestore.com. I don't know if you want to put your email address out there or not, Darren. Doing completely up to you. But D Darren at LearnToRestore.com. Doesn't get easier than that. There you go. There you go. Uh, and I will attest to the fact, by the way, if if you're looking for somebody to help your organization really understand training well, uh, I know, Darren, I didn't tell you, I was, was going to pl plug a little commercial in for you here, but I'm going to. Okay. Somebody that I've learned to really respect uh, and admire as it relates to particularly training in this industry over a great number of years, in fact, uh, spanning now almost three decades. Uh, so thank you for that, Darren, and thank you for the role you play in industry. Uh, and I could not recommend you higher. So thank you for being with me. Fun to be here. Thank you. Thank you, Brandon. Absolutely. So with that, a couple of quick housekeeping notes before we roll over into questions. Uh, again, my name is Brandon Burton, Senior Principal of Industry Relations here at CoreLogic and the Chair of the ANSI IICRC Standards. Uh, and I want to talk a little bit about what's coming up next. Uh, I was able to finally lock down where we're going for the next episode. Uh, I'll give you a full schedule as soon as I've got one, but I'm kind of playing them episode by episode here uh, for the first part of the year. But next month, March 28th, so a little bit later in the month than we typically do them, but March 28th, we're going to tackle fire and smoke restoration uh, with somebody that I've grown to uh, significantly respect in this space, a gentleman named John Pletcher, uh, who was the vice chair of, or is the vice chair of the standard for fire restoration is currently in draft form, just finished some public review. Uh, that consensus body is reviewing those comments now. And the IICRC, ANSI IICRC standard, the S700 is getting close. It's getting very, very close. But John played a critical role in that uh, and is a great technical expert in this space with a good level head for practical, practicality as it re relates to fire and smoke restoration. So he'll join me March 28th. Uh, we're going to talk specifically about the technical of fire and smoke restoration. So I spent all of last year talking about water. In March, we're going to talk about fire uh, with a great, great expert. Uh, also coming up later in the year, commercial water damage, cat response, hardwood floor restoration. I know that was a, a popular request. We're actually going to tackle that one here in just a couple of months. 
Uh, and I've got a couple of great experts lined up for remediation and the cat response, by the way. Uh, once I have those confirmed, I'll announce the names. Many of you will probably recognize them. So with that, let's roll into questions. Uh, la by the way, those last episodes that Darren referred to, uh, just jump on to nextgearsolutions.com, click on webinars, and you'll see all of the technically speaking webinars there if you missed any of our past episodes. 